Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here. It's a sold out evening. I think that has something to do with the excellent place, the Bali, but also with the topic. It is a very complex topic. We just got introduced to a little bit of it. It is complex, but it's also a topic that we are related to, unfortunately, everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you live, in the global south, here in the west. Um, we are going to launch a report, a very interesting report made by the UNDP. Uh, it's about why, especially young people, are recruited, why they step into the hands of, in this case, Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. Why do they do that? What's the reason behind it? And we will go into detail to understand it better. This report is very interesting. It's called Journey to Extremism in Africa, subtitled Drivers, Incentives, and the Tipping Point for Recruitment. What I find so interesting about this report is that if we talk about terrorist organizations, we normally start to almost institutionalize them, as if they are things that just exist. They have a history. If you go back to Boko Haram's early 2000, it started as a movement. There was a certain cause. If you go back to Al-Shabaab 2006, as a splinter fraction of another group. There are certain motives behind it that they exist, and the motives change over the years. So terrorist organizations are never a fixed thing. They change in terms of their dynamics and in terms of how they relate to people. And we also have to understand that although we tend to see them as purely criminal, evil, and violent, 
there are people living in areas where they justify them and are eager sometimes to step into the hands because they see them more as an option than the options that their own government or communities give them. And that makes it tricky. So you can't understand the terrorist organization without understanding the support base. A, su an, a terrorist organization cannot uh, re uh, exist without a support base. You always have to look at the interaction. And this report does that in, a, in an excellent way. Also, it looks at the root causes of violent extremism. It sounds today like that is absolutely the best thing, a normal thing to do. But just keep in mind that in 2006, that's 11 years ago, in the United Nations, in New York, the, global, the, the um, General Assembly approved the global counterterrorism strategy. All countries approved it. And in that strategy, one of the pillars says that you have to address the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism. That means address the root causes. But they didn't say it. Why didn't they say it? Because at that time, just after 9-11, it was completely illegitimate to speak about root causes of terrorism because that might justify terrorist acts. So it was a, a little bit of a US or quite a US driven language that promoted a very difficult idea about what is behind terrorism and not really going into the root causes. Today, Fortunately, we all speak about the drivers, the root causes, the triggers, etc. We go deeper into that, but that's a, a very good point. This report is launched today here in the Netherlands. It was launched before in New York, in Stockholm, in Copenhagen, and in Brussels. Uh, with a lot of ex uh, success, a lot of people were involved, policymakers, citizens. The interesting thing here is that we try to do it in a very informal way, so you're all invited to step in, ask your questions. Nothing is prohibited but you keep in mind that it's web streamed, so it's not Chatham House. So you out in the open, that, that's very important. But we don't put any, any restrictions unless the time, the time is not on our side. Um, so we will do that and we will have very excellent panelists and they will come and give their ideas. We have the authors of the report, the ones that did it, that did the interviews and we have foreign affairs here too debrief and to reflect on it in terms of what it means for our own Dutch policy. And after that we go into a discussion with you and you are open to ask questions. And after that there will be a moment to go with our big friend Ahmed Haji upstairs where there's an interesting exposition of photos. Ahmed is a survivor of the bombing in Kampala in the World Cup 2010 and he has a very, um, let's say, personal story to share with us. So. We hope you stay with us until the end. I would like to ask Mohammed, or I can say Mo, Jaja, from the UNTP. He's the African Regional Program Coordinator. He's the man behind this report. He's going to introduce us to the findings, to the outcomes and the methodology. Mohammed is based in Addis. Welcome. He is responsible for the regional development initiatives in support of the African Union and African Economic Communities. Prior, he was at UNDP's post-conflict specialist in Afghanistan, Guinea-Bissau and Liberia. We will check your Portuguese to see if it's true. But luckily, he's also a peace builder, and that, that's, that's what I like. You've started your career as a peace builder in West Africa. So it's good, I think you can only work on countering violent extremism if you start from the notion of building peace, because it's a conflict transformation approach. And we also have to always have to be that in mind. So, Mo, can I please welcome you and give you the floor for the next 20 minutes? Thank you very much. Uh, I also want to thank, especially, uh, the director from the Security and Policy uh, Unit of the MFA, uh, and uh, thank you for the support that you have provided uh, for for this report. Um, first. Um, I see familiar faces. I have also, before I start, I have to recognize my big boss uh, from New York, uh, Sasha, who's the head of, the, uh, of our work, uh, PV work globally. Uh, whenever we have uh, people from New York, we who live in Addis, uh, we have to say nice things about them, and we like that, <laughs> because it's very nice. Uh, quickly, <laughs> um, I, I will quickly start uh, by showing you uh, why we did it? Because it is a, there's a valid, uh, valid question people always ask: Why should a development 
agency like the UN, especially UNDP, should be involved with this kind of work? Should we not leave it to the military? Is this not a security problem? Uh, especially the kind of acts that you've seen both uh, here in Europe, but also all over the world. And, and I think they're valid questions. So quickly, I want to show you a quick <coughs> map here. This map is interesting because uh, I will not test your geographic skills, because we didn't put the names there. <laughs> but I'm told people in the Netherlands are highly sophisticated, so I'm, I decided not to put the names. Just to tell you, focus on the red dot. The red dot is what we call violent extremism and where it was limited uh, in, the, in 2000, the time of the decade, the new millennium. It was an Algerian civil war. The rest of the continent, or most parts of the world, this phenomenon from 2000 wasn't there. Sometimes we forget. Those were the days when you didn't have to take your shoes off from the airport. You could walk without having to worry that uh, the person sitting next to you was in, in a fight. But this map, I want you to focus on the attacks. So there were about 136 attacks, mainly there. 665 people killed and 428 people wounded. So I'll kindly ask you to play the video now to tell you up to where we are in 2016. Focus on the red dots. Each dot is an attack and gives you a sense of where we are now in the African continent. So this, we stopped taking, we, we continue taking the data, but this to tell you where, this is where we stopped around early 2016, and of course the situation is much worse today. I mean, last week you've heard about the devastating attack in Mogadishu where about 300 people were killed. And every day somebody is attacked somewhere in the world by this specific phenomena. So for those of us who are interested in development, uh, those days we used to think a lot about MDGs and now the entire issue of the SDGs and we really want to get, we have a world where poverty is history. How can you work in these kind of conditions? What kind of development actor can operate in these kind of conditions? And the UN is very much targeted. We have been attacked in Nigeria, as you know, uh, UNDP offices were bombed in Somalia. So for those who are interested in development, then we had to ask ourselves, what, what, is, it, what is it? What, what makes this situation worse? And what is it that we can do? Because we've left it to the security side for 15, 20 years. And the situation is not uh, uh, getting better. So this was a, the curious part. What is it that we can do and what, what has to be done? This, just to say that this is part of a program. I tend to move around, so if you can't hear me, uh, let me know. Eh? Um, so th this is part of a program that is obviously supported by the Netherlands, uh, um, and which means most of you who are Dutch citizens, so thank you very much. It's your taxpayers' money. Uh, but you will see, hopefully, it was a useful exercise. Uh, first, what was the objective? Evidence. The entire sector on violent extremism and how to respond to it is very much historically led by anecdotes and theory. Very few people have actually sat down with these groups in large samples to understand why are people joining more today? Why are more young people attracted to this? And why were they not attracted 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Because it's important to remember this theological basis, this small ideological sect has existed. The ideas have existed for hundreds of years. But why is it popular now? So that's part of the evidence. So we needed to sit down with these young people and see what is it, what's happening. And we needed a specific sample size that will make sense. Um, then obviously we wanted whatever we find to guide our policy and programs, guide policy of the security side, guide policy for those of us who are interested in development and who anybody else who wants to work in this sector. And of course, finally, for us who have a specific program on, on violent extremism in Africa, obviously be informed by that. So methodologically, we, uh, we took what's called uh, we, we, political socialization. The idea of political socialization is really that whatever you've experienced in your life, your environment, whoever you are, from childhood to today has an impact in your perspective. So this is why the concept of the journey was very at attractive. Uh, who are they? Is there something very unique about these individuals that we can, we can learn something about? So the question, obviously, is the title. What are the drivers? The first group we're interested in was those who joined, those who actually took part in this organization in Africa. And then the second uh, target group was those who did not join, who came from similar backgrounds. The question always we asked is, why does one brother join and the other brother doesn't join? Or one, why does one neighbor join and the other neighbor doesn't join? So we wanted to look at what was the difference. So the story of this report fundamentally is, the, is what is the difference between these two groups. And that is the, what, what the, the, the book, uh, 
the report focuses on. We administered more than 200 questions. It takes two hours to interview one individual. When we started this work, we had promised uh, the Netherlands and us, we'll, we'll get the report in one year. It took much longer, and many others. It was much longer, because really, the, the sitting down with one person for two hours, getting the samples and getting access. Access, hopefully we have a debate about access, which was uh, a different component. Um, this is where the interviews were done. Six African countries. Vast uh, uh, majority of the interviews were done in Somalia, Kenya, and Nigeria. Uh, and, and Sudan, we got significant uh, groups from Sudan. Others you see were less. And the reason why, not because we didn't have access. In Cameroon, we had big access. But for, you, for us to take you and your story and add it as part of the data, we had to make sure that you, you, you were prepared to say that you were actually part of this group. Because if you denied it or you are, you're waiting for your court case and other things, so, we, so it was difficult. Someone had to admit. So many of them did not want to admit that they actually had joined these groups. So I started by telling you there were two groups, reference and voluntary, those who joined. During the interviews, we found out a third group, people who were forced. Uh, and, 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 uh, and that's one other aspect that we didn't, we didn't really think about when we started. We were thinking about these two groups. And then we found out there's a huge number of people who were forced. And I'll come back to because there's a specific gender dimension in terms of those who are forced. The sample size, you just see 718. 495 voluntarily joined, uh, 78 of those interviewed were forced, and then there was 145 people uh, who were used as a reference. Now, the green are, are men, the yellow are, are, are female. You will see that the majority of, uh, of those interviewed were men, partly because many people who joined these groups are men. But I think one of the, one of the things we will have wished to do more is to get much more uh, uh, bigger uh, female sample. And the female sample was further reduced because if you look at the first group, 53% are female. So we didn't use, there's nothing specific about your background that makes you susceptible to be kidnapped. So that part of the data was not used to, to look at the, at, the, at the journey because they, they were, many of them were kidnapped, and especially in Boko Haram regions. The groups, Al-Shabaab represented the largest 52%, mainly because we had more interviews in Somalia and in Kenya. And then we had also 27% of Boko Haram, mainly in Nigeria, Cameroon, and uh, Niger. And then 15% from Sudan, which were mainly ISIL, ISIS. And the Sudanese uh, 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 group that were interviewed were 100% foreign fighters. So the people who had come back from Syria, Iraq, and few of them even from Guantanamo Bay. Um, methodologically, so we had all these interviews we used descriptive analysis, and we also used econometric modeling. For those of you who are really, really into econometric modeling, you go to the report in the back, you have an entire annex on how the modeling was done. Don't ask me too much about the econometric modeling, please. Uh, caveats that are really important that you need to be aware of when you're reading the report. For those who know about sampling, one of the things to make a sample size, not only the size, but also to make it scientific, it has to be randomized. But there's no directory out there of terrorists that you can go around and randomizely interview them. So it's, we, we're not, it's not randomized. Second part, some individuals who are in prisons and other things may be influenced by their condition. They may, you know, so it's really important. We will try to reduce this by having double questions. I'll come back to later on how we did that. For example, just to tell you, we'll ask somebody, why did you join? And then we'll ask them, what was your number one need when you're joining? So you have double questions to try to weed out some of, the, uh, some of these uh, factors. And then, of course, the gender imbalance and the country imbalance are also an important factor to, to remember when you're reading the report. OK, key findings. What did we find? Now, by the, by the focus on the word key, there's so many more findings. I don't have, he gave me 20 minutes. So I don't have a lot of time. But there are a lot of other findings. But I've just picked up the key, key parts, which are interesting to me. One, where does recruitment happen geographically? We geomapped people. We looked at where they were born, where their movement. And majority of recruitment in the African context happens in periphery, borderlands, areas with higher level of poverty. This is where people spent the three major countries we had the largest data. We asked them where they spend most of their childhood, 
For those of you who know, that is Nigeria up there, and that is northeastern Nigeria, and that it happens to be also the poorest part of the country in terms of multidimensional poverty. So what we did is we looked at where they came from, and then we applied poverty variation within the same country and looked at if there's something. And the interesting thing is these parts are also the most poorest parts, in also the poorest in terms of access to education, access to every other development needs. And in Kenya, you'll see mainly around the Kenyan coast. And then Somalia, you'll see mainly around where the state has, be, has withered away for many, many years. Not a lot of recruitment up in the, in the Somalia region because you had some level of state presence. Key finding two, this again, just remember we're comparing the two groups. Those who joined had a lower level of secular education than those who did not join. And the figures are here, you will see 16% of voluntary recruits have two years or fewer, 39 have about five to 10 years. If you compare that to, to reference groups, the reference groups had a higher level of education or secular education. Now, the most fascinating part is you, when you apply to religious education, religious literacy. This was really striking because you know the debate you hear globally, uh, we were put on a radio, is the problem in Islam? Are the Muslims the problem? Is something about the theology of the religion that creates this kind of, kind of thing? So we, we were very open about it. And uh, we wanted to, to investigate this specific compound of the relationship with religion. So there's an entire chapter on religion. What we found is half of those who joined, when we asked them, why did you join? Half of them say, I, am, I joined for, to fight for my religion. Obviously, the most obvious thing to ask later is, how much do you understand your religion? So we applied religious literacy. And 57% of those interviewed had little or no religious uh, 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 understanding. So reading of the Quran, reading of the Hadith, understanding, even understanding the basic interpretation because it's in classic Arab, classical Arabic, very few of those had that uh, understanding of those relig the, the religious teaching. The, the inter important factor of this is then you require conduit. You need somebody to tell you the, what you're fighting for. So you need somebody else to tell you. So there was uh, the involvement so of, of a third party in that sense, in terms of. So you have a specific chapter on this that you can look at. Uh, employment, I mentioned double question. So you ask somebody, why did you join? Or why, why are you joining? They'll say, oh, my fighting for my religion. And they'll tell me, then we ask them, what was your number one need when you were joining? What you wanted in your life? And employment was the number one need for many of them, but not only employment. So the data you see, 34% was jobs, their number one need when they were joining. 25% had uh, security as, as, as the number one. The one mentioned, you see the countries where we were talking about this high level of insecurity in some parts, and the state is little, uh, present, especially in border areas. Then education. Some others mentioned education. And there was a significant part of 15% who were looking for husbands or wives. And somebody once then told me that if they only had Tinder, the situation would be, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but it's just to tell you that uh, the issue of uh, husband and wife plays an important role for 15%. Uh, key finding five, institutions. And this is very important for UNDP, especially for us who are tasked to work on this. Area, and especially the government of, of Netherlands were also really invested heavily on issues of rule of law and security and also uh, issues around democratic governance. But there's very, when we ask people the level of confidence in institution, the ability that democratic system works for you, the confidence was very, very low uh, uh, in these institutions. So the data here you see, there's one, the red is the, those who joined 78% limited or no trust in politicians. The politicians part, to be fair, is a global problem. Uh, but other things like uh, institutions, security apparatus, uh, so there was very little uh, trust in institutions. While trust in community leaders and religious leaders are, is very high, which also tells you then where, where the response should be anchored, where our response should be anchored, and where the opportunity exists. Six, speed and age, we were really interested are these people like me in my uh, 40s, or is it young, young people, or are they, uh, are they uh, so we want to know the age, but also how long does it take before, be, between first contact and joining? So we wanted to know. So if you're introduced today, you meet somebody, and how, how long does it take you? So now, this was a bit scary. 80% were 
joined in the first one year, 80%, and 48% in within one month. So compare that to program design. I always say they compare that by the time I have a program and I convince Vincent and Allo to fund it, uh, no criticism on you, but just to tell you how long it takes to develop programs, while well, these guys are highly effective. They, they've already recruited um, half of the people in less than a month. So it's our response strategy, in a sense, in a serious note, is really important. We need to move as fast, as agile, and as flexible as, as uh, the recruiters. Uh, the age group, 17 to 26, it goes up to 11 and over 36. If you're over 36, they don't want you. So for those of you here who are over 36, you're out of uh, any opportunity. But, but, they, but really, the, the days is, is around 17 to 26. This is where they go. And, and I, I, we have experts here from the field. We have Ilward and others who can explain more why they target these young people. Is it because they're young? Is it because, you know, it would be good to know. But really, there's a really over focus on very young people, teenagers. S uh, seven, the, you know, there's differences, but one of the most fascinating thing is this, that is a localized network. It's not some foreigner walking around in, in rural areas trying to recruit people. It's a very localized. 50% of the groups were introduced by their friend, somebody they know, somebody they have confidence in. So the issue is how do and do we respond? How do we ensure that we also, those of us who want to stop this phenomena, how do we make sure that, that our response is very anchored at that level as well? Because Trust seems to be a high level. Uh, the recruiters use people who, who have high level of trust. 50% as I say. And the religious figures, very small compared to friends and, uh, and family. Uh, tipping point. Now, we asked people, we, we compared the education level, we looked at their geographical needs, we looked at their, uh, every aspect of their life in that journey. There are things about unhappy childhood. You will see a chapter in terms of family structures. There's a specific chapter on that. But we wanted to know what was the transformative thing that happened in their life that made them say, OK, today I'm joining. Today, it's it. this is it. This is where I'm going to go. And we asked people in northern Cameroon who never met in the interviews we did with Ilwad in northern Somalia, in, uh, in places like Galkayo and other places where we did inter uh, interviews. Or, in the uh, 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 Kenyan coast or in uh, 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 Niger. All of them come with this 71% mention some form of government action. What does that mean? So we break it down. What, what do you mean by government action? One gentleman told me he saw his mother, the security services were looking for something. They came to his house and they slapped his mother in front of him and he felt that he had to do something about it. Others talk about their friends being imprisoned. Others talk about torture, extrajudicial killing. So the way the state responds is as important as, as anything else. Because what is happening now is the response of the security sector in itself becomes an accelerator, a fuel. It's important to, to, to note that the security sector is not causing people to be terrorists, but is pushing people. And this is, so sorry, I don't know why my, I was in Alabama last week, so the time difference. Um, Sorry about that. Um, so just to tell you, this is extremely important uh, in terms of how governments respond. And, and this is one of the aspects that we want to talk about, because what we are telling our government now is uh, human rights, rule of law, due process, it's just not a nice thing to do. It's actually a prevention strategy. It's about, it's about uh, reducing recruitment. So you just don't do it because it's a, it's a Western uh, concept of, of, of rights. It's actually. People, people want, uh, you, you do this, you follow the rules, you, you are operate within those, and you have a higher chance that you don't add fuel uh, to, to, to the problem. What does that mean for program and, 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 and policy and program? One, obviously, the security side is an important side. I know that the Netherlands supports a lot of security sector reform and rule of law, so I think this part is really important to focus on how the security sector operates. Obviously, we think development actors have an important role to play, and this debate has not been won. Let's be honest. We have made a lot of progress, but the debate has not been won that the, the development actors, you've seen that this is not is a process. Uh, radicalization, or what you call it, how someone becomes a, an extremist, is not something uh, that just happens. It's a, it's a process, and that process of prevention and sustaining peace as the, the new uh, work that our Secretary General is pushing is really important in, in, in that sense. 
And obviously, the military side alone won't win, uh, and it hasn't. Uh, so then the other part is the whether ODA has a role and what is ODA and what is PV. There's an entire debate of PV, PV relevance, and it's really interesting because we, we just did some work with the Netherlands and we produced a specific paper of understanding the tiers of relevance uh, between what is PV specific work that buys time, you've seen how quick recruitment is happening, what you can do in the short term to disrupt recruitment, while over long term normal development takes impact. To, to change a society, to transform economies is not something that happens overnight, it's a long term process. These groups feed in those uh, gaps and what is it that we can do to buy time? And that is essentially PV specific programming as uh, separate to PV relevance and we can, we can discuss that. For not yet internet. This is important because Ilwad always reminds me, and she'll be speaking soon, you'll hear about from her, uh, how much amount of money that has been spent on slick uh, YouTube videos, uh, online, online propaganda that never reaches anybody, especially in the African context, because that is not where recruitment is happening. In Africa, recruitment is a personalized process, it's social, local networks, it's friends introducing you. So here we have those interviewed how many times they visit the website, what is the relationship with the website. So any, any response agenda in, in African context, especially for counter-narrative, your web is not the best place to go. However, that, that, that also means that with Africa's really uh, transformative economic development we are seeing and the increase of, of the net, what will the future of recruitment look like? If now recruitment is labor intensive, what does, does the future look like? And uh, there is an op opportunity and a threat, I suppose, from a prevention side. Exit pathways, one of the most important thing we looked at uh, as we were doing the interviews, many of these young people regret that they joined. Some want to leave. Some are shocked with the level of violence they've seen. Not all of them, but some are. Others were, thought they were going to join some form of avenger and they, they, they are locked as a cook or cleaner because everybody has a different role in the organization. And they don't want to, they want to leave. For those people who've made mistakes and want to leave, we have to create exit paths. We have to allow people to be able to come back to society. And how we do that is really important. You can't arrest and kill everybody. So this creating exit path is a really critical component of the uh, policy implication uh, and response. This, this graph specifically shows you the regrets and people, what people felt once they joined. Programming, catch up development and peripheral area. This is already something that many other governments, including the government of Netherlands, is already thinking about. Uh, you know, development theory is based on the idea that you invest where you get higher return, right? Humanitarian the uh, principles are based on where the need is most. It's time I think development communities start thinking about where the need is most, not only where the returns are quick. Because uh, and that's what has been anchor, uh, that has anchored development thought for many years, that how do I invest to get more in, for development returns? But the, what this tells you is the needs are in places where they, the population is not higher, so you're not going to reach a lot of people, but there's high level of poverty. How do we invest in those areas? And that, I think, is one of the uh, key programmatic implications. Uh, we talked about where trust lies. So the response or any programmatic response has to be localized. The messenger is as important as the message. Some of the young people who were recruited say they, they, they did know about a specific individual or a specific program that was trying to stop them from joining. But they didn't trust who was preaching or who was running those programs. So it's really important we think about who the messenger is. This is important, uh, uh, religious and, uh, and religious institutions and how we create resilience of religious institutions. Many African uh, Muslim leaders have really come together and they really want to do uh, 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 ensure that their religious institutions are not easy for takeover. In many places you go, it's one imam and easy, it, you know, people with more money will come and they'll push him out. The, 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 uh, in madrasas and mosques, especially madrasas, there's a curriculum. I mean, can you now imagine any of you sending your kid to a, a school where you cannot read the curriculum or there's no curriculum? And this happens. People are going to places where you as a parent have no oversight of what your child has been taught and whether what your child has been taught is in line with your beliefs. So this is what the African religious leaders want to change and, and this is something that we really need to support. That's not me. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. It was very concise.
You kept to your time limits. That was excellent. There were quite some abbreviations like PVE, CVE, etc. Don't worry, we go into a little bit more the specifics of that, so we will explain that. Allow me to introduce Hester Thompson. Hester has a long history of over 20 years on different issues and posts at the Ministry, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She's been in Hungary, Tanzania, and worked for former Yugoslavia. Joining the Security Policy Department as a head of the Crisis Man and Management and Peacekeeping Operations Division, you have been also deployed in Afghanistan and different places, if I'm right. 2030, very important time, because Hester went to Lebanon to become the ambassador for the Netherlands to Lebanon. She worked there until November last year, very recently, um, and the refugee crisis we all know in Libya, uh, Lebanon and the instability in the country, both related to the Syria, formed the background of her position today. Early 2017, this year, she was appointed director of security policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which she is still today. As I will reflect on the findings from Mohammed from the report, from her position at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or more specific from the Department of Security Policy. Esther, please. Thank you very much, Volko, and thank you very much, Mohammed, for a very, very interesting uh, presentation of this important report. And I must say it resonates with a lot of experience that I had in Lebanon as well. So I think, of course, the findings are specifically on Africa and the interviews that you did, but many of the, uh, the findings, and especially also some of the recommendations, I think, are much broader than, uh, than that. And I'm extremely happy to have such a body of evidence to be able also to have this discussion much more, as you mentioned also, not just on anecdotes, but really on something that gives us uh, the arguments that we have already been trying to put forward, but sometimes a difficult case to, uh, to argue. So thank you, thank you very much. I think it's also very important that you have um, match two unlikely bedfellows, so to say. The bedfellows of terrorism and violent extremism on the, on the one hand and uh, development practitioners on, on the other hand. For a long time, those were very worried to engage on issues relating to violent extremism, especially from the development cooperation point of view, the fear for securitization of aid. And I think that's also something that has now been demonstrated, how very much interlinked development and security are, and how this might also help to overcome this mutual reluctance that is there. And I will now try to highlight how I feel that the Netherlands can contribute to a more sustainable response to prevent violent extremism, indeed from the perspective of uh, being the security policy director. So actually I don't administer a large bulk of money. Um, what we mainly do at the security policy is work on counterterrorism, we work on cyber, we work on uh, weapons of mass destruction, peacekeeping operations, and NATO and, and OSCE and OVSE uh, and EU policies. Um, so it's, it's a slightly different angle. On the other hand, the way we work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very much integrated. We have very close connections to the Stabilization and Humanitarian uh, Department, but of course also with the other more structural um, uh, departments that focus on, uh, on development cooperation. I think what we really need to do is tackle the broader issues in state citizenship relations, because here we've seen also that they particularly play out in confrontations between security forces and the local communities, and that's also where my responsibility steps in. And in Lebanon, as I mentioned already, I, I witnessed that a journey to extremism was not exclusively a personal experience of adolescents clicking through clips of beheadings of ISIL flags. Actually, we supported the Samir Kassir Foundation who came to the same finding. It's very localized. It is through people that they, that recruits or potential recruits trust that they actually enter these, uh, these, um, these organizations. But also seeds towards radicalization are very much shown uh, by sectarianism, at least in the Lebanese society. So the feeling of margin marginalization, uh, to be excluded of some of the benefits, really played into the, uh, the card of the, uh, those people who wanted to radicalize people. Um, for instance, the case of Tripoli, a city in the northern part of Lebanon, which already throughout the civil war, there was a very much uh, a, a difficult and much, of, much tensions between uh, the Alawite community and the Sunni community. Of course, then when the war in Syria started, it was a war very much perceived to be between Sunni and Alawites. 
there's the feeling uh, among some of the Sunni groups that an organization like Hezbollah had the free hand to go into Syria and to help the Syrian regime, whereas for them, people from the Sunni community who would like to help their Syrian brothers, especially at the beginning of the uh, civil war in Syria, were apprehended and treated as terrorists. So this is also very much buying into the, the feeling that there's injustice in the security system and that there's a measurement between two cups. Also in the city of Tripoli, there was a lot of tension and there was a lot of fighting by times. There was also terrorist attacks, two mosques were being attacked, people were killed, and of course there were lots of clashes. And the army was uh, the one who was responsible for keeping stability. But they were perceived to be biased as well. So what we did was sponsoring them through a CIMIC program, so civil military cooperation, at least to build their relationship with the local uh, community in, uh, in the, the Sunni community in Tripoli. And that already then started a better communication and a better understanding of what the responsibilities were of the Lebanese armed forces and to take away some of these perceptions amongst that, uh, that population. And since um, the security sector accelerates this recruitment process, as we've just seen, I think this is very important for us to uh, keep that in our mind whenever we support uh, security forces, to really focus also on this trustworthy relationship between state and citizens. Because it's also, of course, not only the security forces, it's not only the police, it's not only the army, but it's government forces uh, as a whole. And also other government authorities might uh, uh, hinder um, the, uh, the feeling of inclusiveness, especially when it comes to the absence of basic state services and often the predatory character of the state in some of the peripheral areas. Um, so also there in Iraq we see that, uh, that so some of the uh, Sunnis were in, driven into the hands of ISIL because of the feeling of neglect. Um, and I think it uh, explains also why, uh, for instance, in, in uh, Mali, the Fulani find an alternative in Ansardin. Um, so if a government provides safety and security, if it delivers basic services, and if it does so in an inclusive manner, then it establishes the legis legitimacy and earns the trust of its population. And then it becomes more resilient to violent extremism as a result. And of course, unfortunately, many African countries and their security forces, as underlined by the report, fail this test, and sometimes sp spectacularly so. So how can we as the Netherlands contribute to a more sustainable approach to prevent violent extremism and address UNDP's conclusions about the role of governance and the state citizenship relationship? First of all, to my mind, it starts with political will. In the Netherlands, at least, there existed a p political will to invest in the prevention of radicalization abroad. Since 2015, we can come back to that later also, we have invested in preventive efforts. After all, it's a transnational threat, radicalization, with direct effects for our own national security. So that's also the rationale for us to invest in the prevention of it. Our focus first and foremost is on strengthening cooperation with those countries struggling to deal with large-scale violent extremism. And within uh, the Global Counterterrorism Forum, it's a forum of more than 40 nations uh, who are discussing the, the, the practices, uh, how to deal with uh, terrorism and to share good practices also. We also have very close cooperation with African countries and we offer best practices in policies to prevent and counter violent extremism. And that's very much a two-way street. We have to learn as much as possible from other countries' experiences. In our dialogues with the governments in Africa, we discuss our own role, so their role, our role as a, as a donor, but also our role in our own country in fueling radicalization processes. For instance, in Nigeria, um, we chose to cooperate directly with the Office of the National Security Advisor. And our support was very much geared towards providing concrete alternatives to a security-only response. So instead of only focusing on security, making sure that the Office of the National Security Advisor also has these other more inclusive uh, phenomena uh, and uh, respect for human rights and these things in mind. And as a result, Nigeria has recently unveiled a new national CVE, so Countering Violent Extremism Strategy, that puts much more emphasis on preventative measures. In Kenya, another uh, project that's going to be um, submitted is that we committed to support to the Kenyan government to monitor the effectiveness of their community-based approaches. 
and we aim to demonstrate that these alternatives to the traditional security first approach um, that they work better to at risk individuals and I think that was done by Mohammed's report and also by these more localized reports we can uh, we can uh, find a body of evidence again to convince national authorities to work more on that and of course it cannot be implemented overnight and I think to support our message to other countries that a soft approach actually works, we also fund a large number of small-scale PVE, so preventing violent extremism initiatives. And we seek to test the, effective, the effectiveness of innovative methods for prevention on the ground and in those community networks that fuel radicalization. We help to improve community policing in Tunisia and empower youth in community-level politics in Mali and Nigeria. And then indeed, I think Mohammed already has mentioned that also, we have to measure then what these programs do and try if we can translate them to bigger programs and also convince the bigger um, community and make sure that also the other development cooperation colleagues are focusing on, uh, on this. Um, one of the challenges, I think, in the security domain for now, if we look, for instance, at the Sahel, is the G5 Sahel. Uh, we're all um, focusing on that. There's a definite terrorist threat. There's a high security needs in the Sahel, and these are evident. And they require very um, direct and operational support to the regional forces who are going to be composing the G5. So it's regional security forces who will come together in this, um, in this joint uh, forces to fight terrorism in the regions around Mali and uh, in the Sahel. But we also have to make very, very sure that not too repressive counterterrorism operations will then fuel radicalization. That's just what we learn. It's in an area where there are, um, you know, it's remote border areas. Probably a lot of them feel left out as it is. Um, it's areas where also smuggling is part of daily life and ancient history. There has always been smuggle paths for for one uh, for for one thing or another. So it's very. Um, important not to feed into perceptions of marginalization of these specific groups. So also there, the, the phenomena of do no harm very much enters the, the debate that we have also within the European Union on how we as a European Union can support the G5 and make sure, on the other hand, that there will be no harm done and hopefully also a lot of respect for human rights and uh, making sure that there is some inclusivity in the program as well. So we want to scale up and we should do more. I think that's the conclusion that, uh, that, we, all, uh, that we all share. Um, we aim to integrate a PVE lens, so preventing violent excrement lens, in our broader development cooperation programs in the region as well. And also the recently adopted um, agreement between the government parties very much also focuses on uh, the root causes and it mentioned ter terrorism specifically also. So that's something where we are going to work and see how we can reallocate some of the development budget to better address the root causes of terrorism, migration, and climate. It's not to say that the old stuff can get out of the window, because we've seen very much how important it also is to work on education and on a job and opportunities and employment. It's just to have this specific lens also for the practitioners that now monitor these development programs to make sure that there's also this angle um, in, uh, in the program. Um, and of course, not every single intervention is uh, preventing violent extremism. We must also resist the temptation, maybe, to repackage every development in initiative as the newest way to mitigate radicalization. I think, again, UNDP has already been a great help to demonstrate which one of our Dutch uh, development programs may help to address root causes, specifically in Africa, of uh, violent extremism, and which uh, should remain uh, on its own. And this is something that we can very much use in the policy de de debates that will follow now that we have the new government in, uh, in place. So I just want to thank you again for the, the, the body of work that you've delivered. And I think uh, there will be a fruitful discussion later on also. Very happy to, uh, to answer questions. But most of all, I'm very happy to have the report at hand to have these discussions with our other government's partners. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hester. And please keep your questions a little bit. We're just going to introduce you to a very interesting lady.
who hasn't had the chance to speak. So I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction floor. It is Ilwat Elman from Somalia. She's the director of programs and development at the Somalian-based Elman Peace Center in, in uh, Mogadishu, isn't it? She works in rehabilitation and reintegration of young people leaving Al-Shabaab. So the people that step out and want to reintegrate into society, they have to go through a rehabilitation program. She grew up in Cameroon, moved back to Somalia six, seven years ago, two thousand and ten, and she has a research center for for the the interview. So we were had some questions about how did you actually care, how did you get in touch with the people, and how did you make them confident? to tell you the things that you want to know regards to peace and so they trust you there. She's also a big award winner. There's a long list of prizes. She has been the International Activist, won the International Activist Award at Harvard University two years ago, and the Global Good Star Award. It's a huge award. So it's very important to you. She's also an advisor to the UN, UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on youth peace and security. We are happy to have you here, and it would be great to hear a little bit from your work and your organization, how you work on a sensitive issue of people that have been part of Al-Shabaab, that are leaving, they have an exit strategy, there are conditions for them in Somalia to leave, and what is your work on that? So can you give us a little bit of insight? Is it on? Yeah. Speak up, I'm quite a loud voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please go on. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so, yes, I work in Somalia, I work running the Amal Peace and Human Rights Center. And just as a bit of a background, the organization was founded in 1990. At the core of it, it is a human rights institution. We work in many different sections, and peace and security is one of them. And our work in rehabilitation and reintegration of young people started in 1990. At the time, we were young people being co opted into clan based militias. And for the last 27 years, where my country has been in war, there's just been different factions of the conflict. You can't do this. So there's just been different factions of the war. We've been through clan based militias, warlords. We've had piracy. And now the newest phenomenon is violent extremist organizations. And our recipe for building peace from the onset has always been less fighters means less fighting. And our approach in, pre in preventing further young people in joining these groups is by giving them an example, first of all, that if you do join, there is a pathway out. So what we do is an initiative called Drop the Gun and Pick Up the Pen. And it was incepted in 1990 by my late father, who was actually killed in Somalia for the work that he was doing at the time with young people that were being co-opted into the clan militias. After the war worsened, my, my family fled, and we had refuge in Kenya for a few years, and then later I grew up in Canada. And I was frustrated in seeing my country still in conflict, and I've always believed that there's a critical mass, that the diaspora has a, has a significant role to play, and I believe that I had a role in the transition out of conflict, so in 2010 I returned to Somalia. And the context I returned to was the height of it, where Al-Shabaab was indeed the most exploitative and aggressive recruiter in the country, and it remains so till today. So the recipe that we had started in 1990 has changed over the years to apply more methodologies that actually target the underlying grievances of why now young people are becoming violent extremists. And we've always had young people being used as tools to perpetuate conflict, but not at this level. So the recipe that we've been using is providing pathways for their defection. And that means giving them psychosocial counseling, providing shelter and refuge, rehabilitation, and then skills opportunities as well, too, for them to rebuild and reclaim their lives. And what we saw through this process is a lot of success in not just supporting the individual recovery of the people leaving these armed groups, but also through them and empowering them with leadership skills, being able to tap into a new demographic of young people that are still considered to be active. Because what we learned in this process and was also reaffirmed through this research is that the most credible actor to actually promote people to leave these groups is someone who has lived that experience. 
it's not us in this room. It's not even me as an activist on ground. It's someone that has gone through the same experience as them and can dispel the myths and the ideologies that are pushed by these groups. So a lot of my work is focused in that right, working with children. We have an agreement with the government of Somalia where children under the age of 18, if they're captured or if they're surrendered, they have to be handed over to my organization's care for the rehabilitation and reintegration, but also working with adults. Adults that have gone and spent many years within the group but have become disillusioned. And one of the things that we saw in this report as well too is that more often than not, people need help getting out. That they've abandoned the ideology that once led them to join the group. And that those viable exit strategies and those pathways to leave simply don't exist. And the way that we do this work in Somalia is through a community-based approach. But what we're learning is that it needs to be a more holistic approach. And um, yeah. Can I ask you, how do you protect them? How do you give them the backup that they need if they step out? Because not only the government needs to give them a certain kind of legal basis and trust, but also the, the full factor from our Shabab continues, isn't it? I mean, there's still a Shabab around. Absolutely. So and what is the condition that you can give them? And that's where we've never used the language CVE in Somalia. We don't use even preventing violent extremism. What we use is social cohesion, dialogue, community, peace building. And in order for someone that has left the group that essentially has two targets on their back now, one for, um, from Al-Shabaab for leaving the group, and we're sending them back into an environment that's not any more enabling or progressive or safer for them, they have that target on their back. And then also from the government where we don't have the legal framework and the judiciary processes in place yet that provide full amnesty for people that have gone through and are in the community. So the only way to protect them once they are in is to create a new support structure for them, a new community. And that's where the dialogue comes in. We partner with religious leaders. We partner with thought leaders. We partner with young people that have influence and command in the community. We partner with women. We, and they actually create a community of support for the individual and take them back in. And part of the skills training that we offer is an opportunity for these young people that contributed to destroying their communities to rebuild them as a means of an entry point to be accepted to come back in. And one of the programs that we recently ran with uh, the United, Mission, United Nation Mission in Somalia is giving skills to young people that are leaving Al-Shabaab, such as rebuilding police stations, courthouses, hospitals. And then once they rebuilt these spaces, giving them back to the community and giving them platforms to talk about what they've done. And without that form of localized reconciliation and acceptance, we can't expect these people to go back into the community. Right. Let's go back to the report and the methodology, and it's a question for probably both of you. How did you manage to find them and sort through them in the three levels? Huh? So you have the, the, the ones that voluntarily left, the, the forced ones, but also the reference groups. How did you find them available to talk in the, in the different areas where you were? Well, by virtue of the work that I'm doing in Somalia, you'll see that a significant portion of the interviews were done in Somalia, I think near around 41%. And because of the trust and relationship that we have with the government, we had access in the national disengagement program. So the facilities that we are already running programs in, the young people that are there, that have surrendered, that have gone, gotten amnesty, we had access to them. And it was all on, the methodology is all on a voluntary basis. We could have had much more than the 41% respondents, but the ones that wanted to speak with us for two hours and weren't getting tired of it are the ones that we interviewed. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, in, in Somalia, that's still a very much fragmented states where there are regional authorities. They gave us access to fighters that had just been captured weeks prior. And I invited Mohammed and his team to come to this remote area in Galkayo with us and to go to the prison. And the regional authorities allowed us to have okay. that space without security forces hovering over us. But it's about explaining what the purpose of this report was. Right. And I think being yeah. able to articulate that made more people interested in actually giving us their time. Yeah. Did it work the same in Nigeria and Kenya? No, I, I, I mean, I think Ilwad is correct. The, the level of state capacity determined the access, right? In Somalia, the state capacity is weaker, so we go to local, local government, uh, the regions or regional governments. Uh, we rely heavily on uh, uh, Ilwad's organizations right. in Somalia. But other places we rely on government, like in Cameroon, in Niger, and others, we have to go through the right. process. Yeah. I think one of the advantage, and I think that's probably the reason we partnered with Netherlands, is really about the reach of the UN. Um, when the, you know, we, people have a lot of confidence in the UN, especially in, in, in places that we've been working for 50 years. 
UNDP has been in these countries for 50 years, even more in some places. So it's much easier. The networks are stronger. The trust is stronger. They know that we are not in the business of, 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 of blaming. Our reports are not going to Security Council. It's not about that. It's about finding solutions and giving the government opportunities and communities opportunities to make sure their young people are not attracted. So in some places, I'm going to be honest, we didn't get access. I could have, there are many countries who are, uh, uh, didn't want to give us access, but there were more who wanted to give us uh, access, yeah. Now, you, you, you did interviews in specific areas. We all know that recruitment processes and crime reduction is, is very contextual. So you, it's very difficult to translate that to our situations. Yeah. However, what do you think about the evidence in this report? To what extent can you translate it to other areas in the world? That's interesting. I was in Brussels and I was talking about borderlands. And one gentleman, uh, what is that place uh, in Brussels called Molenbeek? Molenbeek? He told me Molenbeek is a periphery border area. And and area. And <laughs> no, but the reality is that there is some correlation that recruitment doesn't necessarily happen in the most wealthiest parts of Europe. Right? I mean, when you look at these people who are recruited, they're not exactly the children of elites. Uh, they, they, they are coming from a specific area. So there is that correlation to a certain extent. There's also uh, different, uh, there's a divergence, of course, in the, the role the internet plays. Uh, but uh, in terms of frustration and, and, and the ability of this ideology to mold itself in the condition it finds you, uh, it's really interesting. I had a really big debate with an ambassador, a, a Western ambassador that should not be named. Um, we, we had a really open debate. It was in Kenya, and he was telling me, but I know, I know a, a doctor from Machakos who joined this group. Mm. So poverty has nothing to do with it. And I was saying, how many doctors have joined? Against, I can tell you, hundreds of others who are not doctors. So, and, and, uh, so it, this is the kind of uh, debate we still have. Right. But I think what this report does is it puts evidence on, on, on the table. And hopefully, policymakers will have much more than they've had before in terms of how to make this, this uh, right. decisions. Yeah. Very good. Now, there, there's always the question that, of course, there's an interrelation between security and development. <coughs> and, and it's a chicken egg. Like, first development, then you get security, but you have to provide security in order to get development. It sounds also in line with the conclusions of this report. It sounds like very logic, sort of to say, linear thinking. Like, OK, you don't have to convince me. I, I, I believe this. Why did it take so long for the UNDP to step on the CV? a long time of discussion in New York, in Geneva, with the UNDP, the UNDP being rooted in a lot of development programs. And just two years ago, the UNDP started to move and is now one of the biggest movers in this area. It's good, I think, for us all to understand a little bit of the struggle from the development part to step in the security domain. Can you give us a little bit of insight? And it's, it's a question to the three of you, but you, you are an insider, so maybe if you start. I Sorry, think you're trying you to put me into here. trouble. I, I can see, but no. On, on. Uh, frankly, I think uh, the, the the nature of the violence uh, uh, and 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 the growth of it. Uh, I think for many for many of us for many for longer period there was a really a, a, a convincing argument that this is so dangerous. These people target you. They target everybody. Maybe the security side and the state. I mean, the state. The, the number one role of the state is to, pro to provide security, right? So there was a lot of, uh, also, uh, and there was no entertainment from the state side, and there was very internal, uh, we, we had to, we, you can't just say a development actor should be involved. Mm -hmm. We had to put something on the table, what our role will be, and how does, you know, how does our role look? And I can tell you within UNDP, we had a two, three year internal debate. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that internal debate, those who said we should, we should get in there and, and, and do much more won that debate. But there was a lot of internal resistance. Maybe this is not an area. And what are the risks? There's also risk issue. Uh, now, PVE is associated. UNDP is working on PVE. Are we going to be more of a target? And my answer always is, you think Al-Shabaab is not going to target you because you don't do PVE? Uh, you are going to be targeted, whatever you do. And we have been targeted. We, uh, we lost staff in Somalia and in Nigeria. We were not working in this area. So there was a risk issue, but also there was, we needed to put something more concrete. I remember early 2000s, there was an entire debate, should development organization be involved in conflict prevention or peace building? There was a similar debate. And now that debate has gone. 
This is the same thing. And, but we had to show that uh, we were not securitizing development. And I think this is really important because there was a really f big fear that is the, are we taking development and making it to a security program? And what we're saying, no, PVE means doing development better. We are not, I mean, and this is the work we're doing. I mean, this is a frank discussion we need to have. We are not in these periphery areas. Our presence is, our footprints in border areas is very small. We're trying to correct that now. And that's why we have a lot of more border programs are coming up. But this is work like PVE, the work we do in PVE tells you, actually, you have to go in these areas. You have to invest in these areas. It, it was a debate. I'm happy that the debate was won in, in favor of those who wanted to do it, people like Sasha, who now lead our global work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think without that, those forces from, he, he was our resident coordinator in a really important country in Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan. And, his experience and other experience also reinforced the idea of saying, look, we, we have to get in here and we have to invest heavily on prevention. Thank you very much. Esther, how do you see that coming from security policy? Are you happy that development steps on board? Um, well, I think, first of all, it's also money is not abundant nowhere. So it's, it's also a, a quest for resources to a certain extent. And then you have, indeed, as Mohammed said, I think to spend it as wisely as possible and to make sure that what you do, you're going to do better and with better results. Um, so I, I don't feel or I don't see it as, uh, you know, the development is coming towards security. I think we find each other somewhere halfway where we can see where we can mutually reinforce each other. Because also, of course, for uh, troops to, organ to, 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 um, to operate in environments which are very hostile to them, you increase the cost of their, of their own security. Mm -hmm. So therefore, your programs become much, much uh, more expensive. So the whole idea, I think, is here also, like how can you make sure that something uh, that, that you put your that, that you put your money that wisely that you prevent uh, other a other required actions that are even more expensive. Now we say, well, money is not there in, in abundance. We all know that it started after 9/11 with setting up global counterterrorism strategies, where we are mostly hard security and very much mit militarized. Then we stepped into the time of CVE, countering violent extremism what seems a bit of an explanation in softer terms of counterterrorism strategies. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like the PVE is the buzzword. Yeah. So we can really work on the prevention of violent extremism. This means long-term approach. You can include all kinds of levels of communities and citizens. So this is a whole of government, whole of society inclusive approach, which means that it's going to cost a lot of money. So do you see that there is commitment from the big donors in, in terms of spending that on PV and not all on the military side. Um, I'm happy to, because I, I really don't think it's, it's a lot of money. Uh, because if you look at the tier of uh, relevance, it's really important to, to I mean, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, not calling every, the development work is not PV 99% of the time. Many of, many of the countries do not have violent extremism problem. We have 54 African countries. Very few have this problem. They're not even close to 20. So the problem is not widespread. The devastation and the impact on the rich has, has, grown, has grown. So it's, uh, the issue is not to say it's development PV, uh, and, and, and the issue is not to take development programming and uh, repackage it, which is high risk in a, in a, in a, in a, in a climate of uh, 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 less funding for multilateralism. Mm -hmm. ODA is still high, but m less of it is going to multilateral organizations. So there is a, that uh, knee-jerk reaction in time to say, let me package and go to where the money is. But what we are saying, and I think the clarity in the report and the work we did with, uh, with the MFA here, it was to say, you need to, make a, you, you need to say that all ODA, can be, all, PV, all ODA can be relevant for PVE, because what does that mean? It means doing development better, it's going to where the needs are, it's about targeting young people, uh, it's about building a stronger relationship between the state and citizens. But that is your normal development program. But then you have a PV specific. PV specific is to say there are pockets and areas that need urgent attention to buy us time. Because the, recruit, the, the recruitment is happening in an unbelievable speed. Mm -hmm. So how do we disrupt in the short term? And I think development actors have that role in the short term disruption in terms of providing alternatives in, in hotspot areas. Yeah. But you're, I don't think all development work should be PV. And 
at the money that is required for PVE is, uh, is uh, in my opinion, it's not there, but it's very small. It's, it's very limited. Yes, yes. It's very limited. One of the very interesting things of the report is that you make a distinction between the, the root causes, and we all can agree of long-term bad governance and governance areas where the government does not provide the services in terms of education, health, but also security and justice, that is going wrong. That gives the breeding ground for, for recruitment and the support base for terrorist organizations. So there you come to the point to say there are trigger points in the life of individuals that push them into it. And luckily still today, 99.9 .9 and a lot of the people are not pushed in it, living in the same conditions, but there are some that are. And you, Hester, you made a point very clearly that from a Dutch perspective, this is an entry point when you relate to other governments, keep them accountable for doing the right things. Yeah. Now we all know that the rhetoric is beautiful. And if you go to the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy and the UN PV Plan of Action, we see that it looks nice on paper. How are we going to assure that in practice, governments are going to act within the frames of human rights and humanitarian principles? I think first and foremost to have this kind of evidence also at the table because really I think it's, it's, it's a matter of uh, trying to convince your counterpart what the effects would be of the implementation of these kind of you know, r human rights programs for their military forces, their police to appreciate the concept of community policing and how we can help with, with integrating that, uh, that, that process, how we can, for instance, also make sure that there is um, a complaint box, so to say, or a complaint radio station for uh, people who feel affected locally by international forces or by joint multinational forces to, ma to make sure that um, this 71% this will not happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's also some kind of a target, I think, a, a target figure for governments to, to make sure that this, is, this has to be reduced. Um, and it's also very much about, uh, um, I think, the, the, the push on the one hand from their own constituents as well, like here in the Netherlands. You know, if, the, if there are terrorists around, you want, at first and foremost, you want the security forces to do something. But then you want them to do, do to do it in a way that that is right, and do not create these additional circumstances that could then trigger or be the uh, conduct the the um, accelerator yes. for uh, for for these kind of the triggers for this this kind of behavior. And I I think we had the discussion already, but you have now at least more evidence instead of just I know a doctor who also did something that 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 could feed into this, uh, this uh, development of, uh, of the programs. The programs are mostly there. Um, maybe it's also a, a matter of uh, making sure that there's uh, more implementation and there, that there are more widespread known. And something like the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which I mentioned earlier, is, is a very good platform also to spread these kind of practices and to spread this kind of ideas how necessary it is to uh, to do it, yeah. so also there, I, I think it's not it's not about it's not about money. It's more about attitude and political will to actually implement it. Right. Yeah, political will and then capacity to do it in the right way. Yes, but I, I do think that that capacity is is is, is m well maybe not readily available, but it is definitely available. Also by, for instance, training of uh, UN peacekeepers, uh, training of the G5 uh, troops. There's uh, systems are being set up to have that. Uh, very much part of the curricula, so the human rights, the uh, the, the fact that um, uh, the, 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 the way that people are treated uh, is very much into the curricula, but I do think it helps very much if you, from the cerebral, so to mm. say, just the statistics, also come up with the stories that then maybe then relate also to the soldiers themselves, like what their personal behavior might actually inflict upon right. somebody yeah. who's witnessing that. Like the story of the soldier who's slapping uh, the face of his <coughs> mother, you know, th these kind of things. So there should be a combination of that. And yes, there can definitely be uh, better education programs. Also focusing on adult learning, because I think that's, a, that's a something very important also within uh, teaching uh, peacekeeping uh, troops. But, well, there's, very, there's a lot of entry, entry ways for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. You want for you the question. Luckily, we see a shift from being used as part of the problem them part of the solution and mm -hmm. the Security Council Resolution 2250 is based on that. Youth leadership is very important in to, mm -hmm. to make them part of the struggle against violent extremism. Can you tell us a little bit of how you apply that resolution in your context and keep the government of Somalia accountable for 
being open and inviting to use leadership? I mean, the, the resolution is, an, is a historic document, but for it to be more than just a document, it needs to actually be implemented, and we're not seeing that just yet in Somalia, but through my capacity as one of the advisors on the resolution, what I've had the opportunity to do is to travel around the world to different regions and meet with young people that are working in peace and security and to do consultations. So I was part of the, the, the Arab states consultation, working with young people from all of the conflict affected countries. They're coming from Aleppo, they're coming from Yemen, from Somalia, and really giving their actionable recommendations on a strategy that I'm advising on now on how to really implement the resolution. And we did the same thing in East and South Africa and all over the world. And what's really promising right now is that we're not just looking at young people as perpetrators or potential perpetrators, but this resolution specifically highlights the positive role that young people, particularly I believe young women, are playing in these spaces when they're not just looked at as beneficiaries of resolutions, of declarations, of recommendations and treaties, but as viable and credible partners in this space. And in contexts like Africa, where there's an overwhelming majority of young people, in Somalia alone, 75% of the population is under the age of 30. So that it's, it's worthwhile for governments to see them as partners in the space. And the opportunity that lies, I think, for the EU right now is with the EU-Africa Union Summit that's fast approaching. And the theme is on youth specifically. And with that summit focusing on young people, I think it's very important that the um, EU leaders also really take note of the recommendations that are in this report because it's an opportunity to call the African Union leaders to look at how they can maybe challenge some of these things, these adverse policies, this securitization that is radicalizing a lot of young people and to see them as partners in countering violent extremism. Where it's a very opportune time right now where we have an evidence base, a historical report that actually has an empirical body of evidence that shows why people are joining extremist organizations and a summit that's bringing world leaders together. And a resolution on the backdrop of that too. We're having a growing legal framework that's institutionalizing the role of young people in peace and security processes, so. Okay, thank you very much. I want to open up to the room. I want to grab some questions from your side. Just let's say like four questions. Try to frame them briefly and then we to ask the panel to reflect on them. Who wants to come first? We have two assistants working with the microphone, please. Oh, sorry. I have uh, two questions, one for Mohammed uh, Yahya and one uh, for Hester Thompson. Could you state your background? Can you stand up and, and speak out loudly and say your background? Um, I'm a student. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, public administration and uh, I was just interesting. Uh, I saw this on my Facebook, and uh, was, uh, I was interested to uh, in this uh, environment. Um, first, uh, Mohammed Yahya, I want to thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one. Qu I have, my question is about the methodology and a uh, little bit ab about the results or advice. Um, uh, obviously, uh, I, uh, I assume you also used uh, desk research, and um, I'm uh, curious if you used input from successful African uh, anti-radicalization uh, uh, programs or policies for uh, from African uh, countries such as uh, Morocco or Algeria. They are known for successful uh, uh, or big uh, anti-radicalization programs. And then my next question for uh, Hester Thompson. Uh, what I are, uh, what I'm curious about is about uh, African collabor uh, collaboration, uh, uh, collaboration, collaboration against uh, radicalization, and uh, how can Netherlands support uh, African collaboration? Yes. Um, I'm Russell Porter. I'm with the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, just happened to be here in town. And my question really... <laughs> um, for Mohammed is, could you talk a little bit about, sort of through the research of why people did not join those groups? I, 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 f I think that that information is, and sort of is, is as interesting of why people from the same areas did not join as those who did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
next one. So in the meantime, if you think, let's go to Muhammad and yes, on the on the methodology, uh, we obviously don't put together uh, when we're putting the questionnaire. Uh, when we put in the question, actually, we got a lot of inputs on, on, on that. Um, we, by the way, work very closely with the Moroccan government and their successful program. We actually support a program there. We are collaborating with them on education and how to instill uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, the concept of diversity and tolerance into the education system. So we, we got a lot of inputs and a lot of peer review, in, 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 even when the first draft of the report for many African organizations, including, of course, Elman and the NIM Foundation in Nigeria and others uh, who, who supported uh, the process. But you're right, there are really good successful models in early prevention in some countries like Morocco that is very useful and it's something that we are actually in discussion to see how we can see whether those kind of uh, in, in early initiatives are, are, rep are replicated. But the problem we're also facing is that there are some countries that are in denial that they have a problem. So it's very difficult to engage people who think they don't have a problem. Uh, I remember Kenya 10, 15 years ago, if you asked Kenyans, you, Al Shabaab problem, no, that's a Somalia problem. It's not Kenya. There are no Kenyans involved in Al Shabaab. I think they've changed now. Uh, 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 but I think other countries also have, especially in East Africa that we are facing, Tanzania, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Tanzania has all the, all the um, you know, indicators of problems. I think the third largest fighters in, in Somalia, are foreign fighters are Tanzanians. So. Uh, th there's a lot of things that you can learn in early prevention, but that takes also the political will, as, as Hester said, that, 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 that this problem is, is borderless. If it's not there, it will come to you, and you need to put in place the kind of structures to be able to manage it. In terms of your question, uh, I'm happy you're in town, by the way. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, why people don't join, the most interesting thing is religious literacy and education. It's, it's, uh, the data is really fascinating how both secular and religious literacy act as resilience. We asked some people, why, why didn't you join? Uh, the ideas, the, the ideas A, B, C, makes no sense. They can counter it with something they can read, a religion that they understand that, that they think these guys are not making so much sense. Especially people who come from Sufi backgrounds and others who, are, who all their lives have grown up in the, in the context of diversity and tolerance. Uh, uh, where the Sufi sects uh, preach those things, and then you come with a completely alien theology. Because you have to remember, this, this sect is very new to the African continent. It has very little traditional base. It's imported. Uh, well financed, imported, but it's imported. So if you have your own religious tradition and your literacy, that seems to have played an uh, important role. Just anecdotes, there's some interesting anecdotes. There were even those who end up joining, but were employed. It took them longer to join. So people had jobs who end up joining, but it took them longer to join. I don't know if they were given the notice to the employer, but, but they actually did end up joining. But it's really interesting. There's some in interesting anecdotes. But I think education, uh, opportunity, uh, things like this, which are fundamentally development uh, aspect. And experience. There are those who say that you know, they've never experienced the, the, the security uh, sector interventions that we just talked about. Uh, others, uh, others which worried, worried, worried us is there were others who did not join, so they were not approached. They were so, asked. They were not asked. So, uh, which also tells you whether, uh, then the question is, will you have joined? That's a different story. But the issue is, they were, that someone said, nobody ever asked me to join. That also tells you about the labor intensive nature of recruitment in Africa. Mm. It's very different from that European or, or uh, overall Western recruitment where you can leave a message and some young person runs on that message somewhere and then self-radicalizes. In Africa, you actually, is a labor-intensive process. You have to target the person and send somebody to indoctrinate them. And, and also, that also plays an important role in the low level, or at least in terms of numbers uh, of people joining. Thank you. Uh, yes, on the, the question on uh, the, the, the collaboration uh, between African countries and how we can, how we can support that. Uh, maybe first, uh, there is already a lot of 
collaboration between African countries to, to fight uh, the, the negative outfall of, of terrorism. You see, for instance, uh, in around Lake Chad, where uh, there's a joint uh, task force uh, who works also to combat uh, Boko Haram. You have the G5, was, which was specifically established because of the, the problem that the bordering countries of Mali faced by terrorism coming from, uh, from, from Mali. And so what you see is that there's a, a very uh, clear picture that it affects their own societies as well and that they want to limit it. Um, what you also see is that they provide forces for that um, and that costs them. Um, I was the other, uh, I think, what was it, two months ago, I was uh, in, in Niger, uh, just very briefly, but spoke to the Minister of, uh, of Inter in, in, in Interior, Minister of Internal Affairs, and he told me that nowadays in Niger they spend almost 30% of their budget on security forces. In the Netherlands, we're struggling to live up to the NATO aim for 2% of the, of the national budget. Um, but that also means, as he told me, that that would push away any kind of other money that they would otherwise spend on education projects, uh, programs, or you know, other things that, that would uh, lead to job opportunities or, or these kind of things. So there's very much also joint responsibility, I think, of the international community, because it not only affects those countries, but also ourselves. Um, then I do think that it's also very necessary, so where the cooperation is already there on counterterrorism, it, it also serves as a perfect ground to enter these kind of findings and to make sure that there's cooperation in, in, in that way as well. And for instance, something like that is already something that we support in the region Liptako Gurma, where it's also in, uh, in, in Mali, at the border region with, uh, with Burkina, where we, together with MONUSMA and the G5, um, uh, have a, a, a project for the support for border forces and police in the region to open up these communication channels. So the countries that participate in MINUSMA as uh, troop contributing countries and the G5 uh, forces are already themselves experiencing there on the ground on what the impact of such a, such a program might be. So then you have at the top level, as Ilwat mentioned, also the EU African Summit, for instance, as a, as a means of discussing these kind of issues. And you have very much at the, at the, let's say, lower level of people in the field who are being sent out by their own governments, how this can affect them in a positive way. So that's how we can, I think, uh, support this collaboration even more. We have time for a few more questions. Thank you. Um, I'm Millie, and I'm highly interested in the topic um, because I have a background in public international law and international human rights law. And as such, um, well, above all, two questions have came to my mind. Um, first to Ilwat and to Hester. Um, so Ilwat, I was, um, like Mohammed rightly pointed out, um, what is important here because it's a very localized problem, uh, what is of utmost importance is to create trust um, with the people, with the locals, and uh, like question or well issues like human rights or Western ideas are not really preferred, so to speak. Um, and given that, because you have a Western background, have you perhaps encountered any problems in building trust, or have you had questions in that regard? Um, and then my um, question to Hester is. Um, you mentioned that uh, Netherlands is willing to support this whole project. Um, uh, obviously, the importance of, or well, the consequences of the trans—it's a, it's a global problem. So, uh, the import impact of it to each country is beyond uh, beyond doubt. But I was wondering because, like we understood from Mohammed's presentation, um, the main triggers to these recruiters would be. Um, poverty and a lower level of secular education, which are, well, considerably lower in the Netherlands than, well, in other African countries. So my question was, uh, how, how direct do you see the impact to the Netherlands in particular to be? Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question here. Hi, um, my name is uh, Sarah Reckless, and I work for USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives. So we have we actually have programming in Somalia and in Nigeria and Niger. Um, 
Northern Cameroon and Chad, um, so across across the region and Libya as well, um, focused on CVE. And uh, my question is: is one of the one of the things I appreciate that you highlighted was the need for localized approaches. Uh, I just wanted to get from your perspectives something that we have tried to figure out how to work um, with more informal groups because working with very highly organized and fully capacitated entities is very, very challenging. And wanted to understand if there has been um, thinking, I mean, UNDP typically works through governments and established institutions in terms of these very localized approaches. How, is there, a, is there a, a new way of thinking about engaging with uh, you know, less formalized uh, structures? Um, yeah. Thank you, good question. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I am myself associated with the African Studies Center in Leiden. And my question is actually for the person who can answer it. So um, <laughs> some, someone can answer it, surely. Uh, the interviews were conducted in six countries. So I suppose they were conducted in local languages. Yet um, the, in the report, the results are all taken together under one English description, for example, joining out of a need for employment. And my question is, um, how were differences in language and interpretation tackled when working out the interviews? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Big question. Okay, one more? Yes. Last question. Thank you all for your speech. Uh, my name is Jutje van Oman. I've done research on human rights defenders. And therefore, like... Um, to be honest, this is the first time that I heard about the Elman Peace Center. So my question is for you, to you, Ilvat. Um, like, um, did you uh, did you work a lot with uh, the government? Did you receive uh, support from them? Do you work with the Netherlands, for example? Or how does that uh, come across, your message and everything? And... Um, then also my question is to you, Hester, like, do you work a lot with human rights organizations? And do human rights organizations get support from like, also in other African countries? Like, do they get support from the government? Because of course, you have to work with the government as, as, that, is, as that is the main uh, incentive for those yeah, people being recruited because they lack support from the government. So I'm curious about that, thanks. But let's go to you first. Sure. So on the first question on what my experience is like working in these spaces and the role of credible actors and if that is at all influenced by my background growing up in Canada. Sure, when I, I moved back to Somalia in 2010, I barely spoke Somali. I, I had very strong ideals and visions of what I wanted to contribute to my country, but I learned very quickly that you can't come in with any kind of savior complex. You can't come in with any just ideas and just expect it to work. I've had many a times entire groups, a room, walk out just because I, as a young woman with my broken Somali, dared to put forth an idea. But I learned that reality very quickly as well too. And my work is very grassroots. We have a very large team. The organization founder till today is actually considered the Somali father of peace. And with that comes a lot of local recognition. And with that comes the ability to also work in a lot of highly volatile areas just because of what people know we are about. And there's an, I suppose, an odd sense of protection and being overtly exposed where people know what your vision is for the country and the work that we do. So there are challenges at the forefront when I first returned to Somalia, but I wouldn't say I have those challenges now. I'm embedded in everything that I do. And of course, sitting here in front of you like this, I don't look like this in Mukdishu. And um, yeah, so. It, it requires trust, it requires being on ground. I couldn't do this type of work if I was not present. And when you are with the people, that in itself is an entry point for actually having one-on-one -on -one dialogue. On your question on, and then on your question on human rights and if it's uh, possible, oh, it actually was your question as well too, on human rights, and is that possible in Somalia because they are considered Western ideals? On the contrary, actually. I believe 
one of the problems that we have in contexts like Somalia, where countering violent extremism is volatile. And back to the question I was posed to you, Mohammed, earlier on development. Why has UNDP and development actors not engaged in context of ongoing conflict and waited and left it only for security actors? Human rights has always been considered an afterthought. Justice has always been an afterthought only after war. And this is actually contributing to why more people are becoming radicalized because the state is not accountable. There's vast impunity. And when human rights are not regarded as a key priority during the toughest time, it gives people more grievances and adds fuel to the fire. So I don't look at human rights as a Western ideal at all. People are in desperate search of it. And I believe if it was upheld in countries like mine, it would decrease the people that are having these grievances and joining armed groups. And that's, that's my perspective on that. Um, on the, the young lady sitting next to you, on your question on, are we working with the Netherlands? Are human rights organizations actively involved in the spaces and can we work with the government? We do work with the government in Somalia, but that has its limitations. There are areas where we can work very strongly together and we have been successful in the last couple of years getting agreements on supporting them in the rehabilitation and reintegration process. But just a month ago, four of our staff were arrested for working in this very space as well. Human rights activists are often seen as a nu nuisance, trying to desperately break into this space that is very closed. And what we're seeing in this report as well too is that Sometimes the most credible actors are those that are independent. They are human rights organizations. They are better in the community. They are religious leaders. And this space of security is still very much dominated by the same actors. And that is a challenge and it's right that we're hoping to challenge. And what we saw through this process of the report to get access to actually facilitate these interviews and to have that trust with the people that we wanna pick their brains on, it's those that are most grassroots that can facilitate that. But when it comes to the conceptual design of programming on how best to use resources and to move beyond just implementing partners, human rights activists and those on the ground, sadly, are rarely at that level. We don't, um, we do work with different organizations, the UN, the Netherlands is a big sponsor and donor of the institutions that we work with. So in that right, yes. But I also believe one of the shifts that needs to be done moving forward and following on some of these recommendations is diversifying the partners. It doesn't only have to go through government. It doesn't only have to go through international organizations. You can invest in the frontline activists that are willing and able to take these risks in these spaces. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Well, maybe on, on the first question, like how do these findings uh, relate also to, to, to the Netherlands? Um, that, that's a difficulty, a difficult one for me, so to say, in the sense that it's not my uh, expertise to see in, uh, about radicalization processes here in, in the Netherlands. I do think, as also, al already also was mentioned by Mohammed, like, like in some of the areas in Brussels, probably that, that same goes for us, that there's people who feel excluded from, uh, from our society, feel deprived of opportunities. So these kind of findings probably are, I think, universal for, uh, for, for uh, well, for the globe, and then making sure that also policy uh, makers are aware of that. And what we do have in the Netherlands is, is a very um, integrated approach where at very local level there is close cooperation between the police, uh, between uh, teachers, between social workers, between uh, community leaders, who then all can work on where they see risks for youth to be, to be radicalized and how to approach that. And there's different sets of approaches to that. And repression is you know, one that is, let's say, on the last page of the textbook. It's, of course it's there. Uh, but it's not first and foremost when we are in the first uh, entry phase of the circle of radicalization that's definitely not there at the beginning. Um, on the less formalized structures, I think as government agencies, we all struggle with that. Uh, we have to account for our taxpayers' money. Um, and uh, sometimes you just have to trust an organization that is not you know, going through the, uh, the exact criteria that uh, the, the people who guard your money might, uh, might, might want or might, might require for. So you have to take some risks sometimes. And what we are doing at the moment is taking small risks and then trying through uh, UNDP and other people who monitor our programs to see what kind of lessons we can learn from that and what kind of security we can, or let's say certain as a, a provider of fund can derive can be derived from that to maybe upscale that in in certain uh, in certain phase but it remains a very difficult point I think 
Um, also, in the support of human rights, I would uh, definitely encourage you to look at the, the website of the Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we're quite transparent. We also, on an annual uh, basis, we report on all the different uh, organizations that, pr that are provided uh, by the Netherlands with, uh, with some support. Um, we both have a program that is more uh, working on out of The Hague with uh, bigger multilateral organizations, but also for embassies, for instance, they have a human rights budget to support local uh, human rights organizations. So, for instance, in, 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 in Lebanon, we also had the possibility to support human rights organizations, and you look at what is, what is necessary. So, would it be, for instance, in uh, the LGBT community that you think it's necessary to, uh, to support? Would it be uh, you know, uh, organizations that uh, fight against torture, fight against impunity. Accountability has always been and will always be uh, a very um, important topic for the Netherlands where we try to launch initiatives. But I fully agree, it's, it's, it's too late uh, most of the time. For instance, now in Syria, we, we really try to do our best to have uh, this database to make sure that the Commission of Inquiry, which is a UN commission, has enough, uh, enough evidence, that evidence is being gathered. But as long as the conflict continues and as long as people who are committing these crimes are uh, supported by uh, you know, th their, their backstoppers, there's not much you can, uh, you can do which makes the, I think, the watchdog function of human rights organizations all the more important. Because you can indeed, as you do, you can be a service provider uh, where, you know, step in where the government lacks uh, any kind of action for, for instance, in providing safe places, but very much also advocate and make sure that this space, however limited, grows mm -hmm. and, and does not disappear uh, totally. Because that's also something where we see a shrinking space around uh, the world for, uh, for human rights organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just touch on the language. Um, the questionnaire was in three languages, uh, Arabic, uh, French, and English. And the people who administered it, I'll say 70, 80% spoke the language of the groups who were being interviewed. That's the beauty of working in the UN. I can always find somebody who speaks a specific language or comes. The interesting, for example, the in interviews in Cameroon were done by my colleague, who's a Cameroonian, who comes, who understands the language. Uh, I'm uh, ethnic Somali, Kenyan. My Somali is better than Ilwad's, but I did administer. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did administer some in Somali myself. I did struggle a bit, but I, I did administer them in Somali. So there's always somebody in the UN who, luckily, within the team we had, it was a really big team, that worked on this over two years, spoke uh, some of the languages that we administered them. Um, the question of human rights, I really think, I mean, this debate, I really don't, it's a very difficult debate, which it shouldn't be. How can be individual rights be a value system for a specific culture? Who wants their rights to be abused? I, I don't, I really don't get, I have this debate with, when somebody tells you oh, human rights is a Western. I'm not Western and I like my human rights. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's, this is a, not a debate. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, no, exactly. Nobody wants to be tortured. Exactly. I haven't met anybody who enjoys it. So this, it's one of those things that it's, it, it, I think, is a way of closing the door rather than a strong belief because their own community people want their rights. They, everybody wants their rights to be uh, respected. Um, then there was the question of localized. I really think that is the biggest challenge that the UN faces. I think many governments faces. On one hand, we are trusted by taxpayers' money. And I always say this, and I'm being recorded, so I'm going to be careful. Just to say, I always say that the rich don't pay tax. When you, uh, when you hear stories, oh, it's, it's, it's the, the Netherlands is rich, it's taxpayers' money from Netherlands. The very rich Netherlands, I don't know. I'm sure they don't live here. The point is, it's middle class and working class people who are paying taxes in rich countries. So we have to be careful of how we spend their money. So it's, it's a, a catch-22 situation. You, somebody who works in McDonald's in has been taxed, and, and uh, their tax is coming to the UN and somehow is going somewhere. So we have to be sensitive about people's money. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. Some of the most effective groups don't have financial systems. They can't report. Uh, so it's one of those things, and I think this is a debate that maybe at the highest level needs to be taken up. How do we, because there's also fear of corruption. So the, how do we ensure that we create the balance? Because if we really want to go 
to the level that we want to go, then we need to think how do you get the balance. And I don't think the balance is there yet. We always have to stop at the climax, and I think we're reaching there. How are we going to do it with certain kind of groups and not only be at the top of the, the best organized and best performed, but how really go into the nitty-gritty of the communities, which is absolutely the challenge here. I'm very sorry, time is, is over. I would invite, like to, well, first a very warm applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Before we go up, I would like to ask Megan Price to take the floor. Megan is uh, spearheading the knowledge platform, Security Rule of Law, and that is one of the most important organizers of this evening. So please, go ahead. Thank you for those words. I won't keep you all very long because is this on? I think we're good. Um, because I do realize that I'm uh, stalling a little bit before the next part of the presentation, which I very, very strongly encourage you all to attend. But before we do, just very quickly, again, I'm Megan Price. I'm the head of office of the, the Knowledge Platform for Security and Rule of Law. We're basically a community. We're a network of practitioners, researchers, and policymakers, and we're focusing specifically on stirring debate, uh, engaging in discussion, creating atmospheres precisely like we've helped to create this evening, where there can be a competition of ideas and a discussion of how do we improve security and rule of law programming and policies, specifically in fragile and conflict-affected states. So this is exa exactly the kind of, of initiative that we like to support. We do get our support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, so we work in service of them and our community to try and, uh, and, to try and have these debates and these, uh, and these exchange of ideas. There will, um, on the back of this uh, event, we are going to set up a, a series of discussions with a lot of our practitioner community and our research community to look to see how do we move beyond simply opening the idea or exchanging the information? How do we use that information to challenge assumptions? How do we use it to change minds, to change behaviors? Because basically the idea is that data Pure data is just information without context. So we need that context. We need that, dis that discussion in order to, um, to change behavior. And I want to specifically actually point to something I think, uh, Hester, you put your finger on uh, very, very, point, uh, very eloquently. When we want to change, when we want to convince people, it's not just about statistics, but it's statistics and it's stories. Um, it's creating that human context in which data derives its meaning. Uh, so on that note, I'd like you to all, I'd like to invite you all to the next part of our program, which will take place in the balcony um, just outside, where we're going to hear from Ahmed, who um, is a survivor of an Al-Shabaab uh, attack, the Kampala 2010 uh, World Cup attack. And he's going to reflect upon um, how that event not only stirred uh, a new part of his life, but gave him a new kind of inspiration and changed how he saw his motives and his incentives for operating in this world. I think it's a really important way for us to move away from simply the data and the figures and give ourselves that human context. So I would very much recommend and invite you all to join us. Plus, there'll be beverages. So, <laughs> so thank you again, everyone. Thank you.